Um, so, you know, I just want to just acknowledge that for nine months we've been in lockdown and that, you know, people have been stressing over this and that Jesus is the release of that stress. And prayer is the release of that stress and fasting and spending time before the Lord and saying, look, I know that because I've been a little bit of, uh, in, in an emotional frenzy over so many different things that seem unfair to me that, that I might be more vulnerable than normal to the enemy, but I am not going to let my spiritual immune system weaken in any way because the devil's a liar and he wants to get you to dine on his food. But this is the truth of the word of God. And that's what Jesus said. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. We have that same mission. You know that, right? So whenever the lie looks a little tempting, you counter it with the truth. Amen? You guys can say amen. That's legal in this church. There it is. Yeah, thank God for you too, Nate. Nobody going to throw him out for amening. That's a good thing. We like the amens. <laughs> So, Lord, I just pray that as we read your word today, our hearts would be open. You said it pierces us right down to the division, that dividing line, to the bone marrow of our soul and our spirit, man. It reveals light. It brings light into us. Your word is truth. And we pray, Lord, it will counter every lie that the enemy tries to feed us and that we will reject the invitation to have dinner with the devil and say, no, I, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me, in Jesus' name. <laughs> All right, so John chapter 8 is where that comes from, the father of lies. When I say we're refusing to dine with the father of lies, that's the name that Jesus gave the devil, the father of lies. And the New Testament tells us in James that God is the father of lights. So I'd rather follow the father of lights than lies. The Pharisees uh, often, and the religious people, are painted by Jesus as being in the wrong camp. And he's speaking to them, actually, when he says that you're listening to your father, the devil. These are the religious people. That should be a real eye-opener for us as the church, right? If we expect the culture to change, the judgment has to begin first where? In the house of the Lord. And if my people who are called by my name will... Humble themselves and pray, purpose to seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal your land. I think we need to keep on praying for America more now than ever, yeah. right? And not say, oh, no, it's not turning out the way I thought it was supposed to turn out. Well, we need to always be praying. And if we're sober-minded and we just stay focused, and I don't know about you, but I've been fasting a lot more in the last few months than I ever have in my life. And the Lord has, has been speaking to me. So when I get up here on a Sunday morning, you know, in many churches, they say the word of the Lord for today is, and that's fine. But I believe he wants to give us a specific word of the Lord for today, for us, for this church. And fasting and praying and spending time on your knees allows you to hear the voice of the Lord clearly. Do we suffer from the sin of prayerlessness? Right? That's what Samuel said to Israel. You've asked for a king, but far be it from me that I would sin by ceasing to pray for you. All right? So look, as bad as the culture might look to us, and it does look bad to me, the church has always flourished when the culture is going in the toilet. Because that's when the light shines. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. So that's who we're supposed to be, light shining. The darker it gets, the brighter the light shines. Amen? You good with me on that? By faith, say amen. <laughs> John 8, 37. You are descendants. Jesus, speak it to the Pharisees. You're descendants of Abraham. Yes, they were taking their status in the fact that they were Jews and that they were descendants of Abraham. But here you are plotting to murder me, Jesus is saying to them, because you don't welcome my voice into your lives. And many of the people that you object to, their political positions, don't welcome the voice of God into their lives, right? And most of the time, you could summarize it by what it says in Psalm 2, the heathen are raging against any restrictions. Whatever rules God wants to put on them, we know as Christians that they're there for our good, but they feel to the world that people like, no, I don't need those restrictions because I'm the king of my own castle. <laughs> and boy, that castle's going to blow up 
if you're counting on you being the king. And that's one of the beauties of being submitted to the Lord is saying, no, I recognize your name is above my name. Your thoughts are above my thoughts. I'm going to be submitted to your will for my life because you know better than I do. Everybody found that to be true. I hope so. If you're not raising your hand, then let's say the sinner's prayer right now. Because that's key to being a Christian is that you're submitting your will to the Father, just like Jesus said, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And then in verse 40 of John 8, he says, you're trying to kill me. Jesus, the true son of God, the sons of Abraham, the Pharisees wanted to murder him. And that's spiritual warfare, right? Whenever the local stronghold is being challenged and being threatened, the first thing it wants to do is take out the competition. Instead of saying, I need to humble myself under the mighty hand of God and recognize, you could say to Martha and Mary, God in the form of Jesus is sitting in the living room right now. Let's not worry about the dishes, Martha. <laughs> Jesus said, Mar Mary chose the better thing. He's walking right in your midst. Let's pay attention to what his presence means in our lives and not get hung up about, oh, I'm giving up this and I'm giving up that. The boundaries he draws on our lives are for our good because we don't have the ability in our own strength to control our appetites. And I don't mean that just food appetites. I mean sexual appetites and spending appetites. And One of the fruit of the Holy Spirit listed in Galatians is self-control and temperance. He fills that gap of our inability. You know how Paul said, I try to do it, and the things I try to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I keep repeating. Who's going to deliver me from this mess? It's a real loud answer, isn't it, church? You missed your opportunity there to join the choir. Jesus! It's hard with the mess on, I know, so turn up your volume. <laughs> and then in verse 44, Jesus really brings it. This is not the gentle little Jesus. He's saying to them, the Pharisees, you are just like your true father, the devil. And not a gentle little Jesus, is it? He's laying it out there for the truth. But if you know the truth, it'll set you free. And then Jesus says this in the voice translation. It says, at the core of the devil's character, he is a liar. The very core. Everything he speaks originates in lies because he's the father of lies. All right, so I refuse to dine with the father of lies. How about you? Yeah. Say yes. Yeah. That's a decision that I'm making. I'm going to filter every thought. I'm going to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And anything that doesn't line up with the truth of the word, it's getting rejected. But let me tell you, it looks really delicious, doesn't it? He has a way of being a, a shining light, the devil does, because it's harder to follow God's rules. It's harder to live that disciplined life of walking in that narrow road, right? It's, it's the way to go. It's the better way to go, but the world makes it look very appealing. And I've called it a, a dark anointing at different parts of my life where it seems like when there's an atmosphere where many rebellious people are together, it generates a field of rebellion. Just like we can see the anointing on the Lord where we get together and we worship. It says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And where sin abounds, the grace of God abounds even more. Right? But when you, when you step into a group of people like, a, like the Hell's Angels, let's just say, like anybody that would call themselves that name, I guess I could use them as an example, is like all of a sudden that takes on an extra momentum that can get, that could pull you in. And I work on Wall Street a lot, you know that, and that trading floor mindset is that way. And it's mammon that's the counterfeit God, right? And we know the love of money is the root of all evil, so boom, like there you go. That's a, that's a pretty wicked combination. And yet there's Christians on Wall Street shining light in the middle of that place and bringing people to the Lord who know how empty that whole thing is. So look... But God, that's what you have to say. No matter how big the enemy's force field is, God is greater. And that we are his representatives. We're like the special forces for the Lord. I'm going to go back to Genesis quickly just to give a little review because I think even though it's well-known scripture, there's always something, a nugget in there that we might have missed. So in Genesis 2.16, it says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. How many trees? Every one, right? But then he says, just one. 
of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So people say, well, why would he put it there if they can't eat from it? And it's because he wants us to be obedient to him. And that was the only thing he told them not to do. And because he knows that in our makeup, it's better to depend on his interpretation of the knowledge of good and evil, not ours. But there's next to it a tree of life. And they're allowed to eat of the tree of life. Because he said there's two trees in the center of the garden. We didn't get there yet, but they're both there. And the only one they couldn't eat of was the knowledge of good and evil. Because that's when we think we could take over God's role. And he is telling us, no, you can't handle that. Let me be your dad and listen to what I'm telling you to do. That is not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of brilliance to recognize the creator of the universe loves me as his child and he knows what's best for me. And I don't have to worry about getting tangled up in all these little decisions. I just have to know the word and obey it and do it. And well, if you overcomplicate it, you get yourself in a mess. Just if he said it, I believe it and I'm going to do it. And then in Genesis 3, we know that the serpent comes up and he speaks to Eve. And look at what he says. Has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Like, you don't talk about the biggest over-exaggeration lie that there could ever be. It's the exact opposite of what God said, that they couldn't eat from one tree. But Satan is saying, did he tell you you can't eat of every tree in the garden? Because he's testing to see what her knowledge is. And she did give the right answer to some degree. So she said, no, not the tree of good and evil. But she said, we can't even touch it. And he didn't say that, you know, actually. So that could be a little bit of a, a, a chink in the armor, maybe. But then we get to this idea of the meal. And I said, we're refusing to dine with the father of lies. Because what was Satan trying to get her to do was to take food. To lose control of an appetite. And God is saying, look, you have lots of appetites in your life, and I want to help you throttle them so that you can flourish, so that you can live within the boundaries of discipline. And on your own, you probably will, 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 will make mistakes and think you can handle something, but it really won't be good for you to do that. So live within the boundaries I set for you. Marriage, man and a woman, covenant relationship, sexual relationship, you wait for a commitment and you wait for a lifetime covenant, and then you enter into the intimate relationship of marriage because you have a commitment for the rest of your life. For better or for worse, you're gonna to stay together. That's a great rule, folks. Great rule. Oh, now I think we can adjust that one and let's just live together for a while and try that. Yeah, bad idea. Really bad idea. See, but we know better because we ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We couldn't handle it. You believe that? doesn't mean you're weak. It means you're interdependent with God. I'm going to do it your way. So it's interesting to me that the first commandment that God gave in the garden was about what not to eat, right? You could say that was a commandment. It wasn't written in the ten stones, but God is speaking to them. And he said, that's the only thing you ought to do is just don't eat from that tree. So, of course, the devil's going to come after that one thing and say, did he really say that? You know what? He's... He's not being honest with you. This is what the devil does. He tries to turn it around and say, he really is threatened. He knows if you eat from that tree, you're going to be just like him. And God is very insecure. <laughs> He's worried you're going to be just like him. And then you, go, you get like, yeah, I think that might be true. Like, I think I should have knowledge of good and evil. This is how our flesh is working. Because we're not fasting and we're not praying and we're not staying grounded in the word. And, and it's like, yeah, I, I should have more rights. I should be able to have sex with more than one person, not just the, the, the person I marry. This is common in our culture. Very deviant kind of sexual behavior is accepted as like, oh, no, you Christians, you're too repressive. <laughs> no, sorry. Deviant behavior is not repression. That's a healthy look at life. To say some things are sacred and sex is sacred. Marriage is sacred. You don't defile sacred things, right? That's for our good. That's for our good. So then he lies. So the first commandment is about a meal, and then the first lie is about a meal. So clearly the devil wants us to eat his food, and he's trying to get us to keep changing our diet. 
It says, and, you know, I said it already, he was trying to discredit God's character. Now, I thought back to Daniel, right? And he's clearly a very smart guy. Daniel knows the ways of the Lord. He gets taken away as a slave, and he's brought into captivity in Babylon. As, as Jerusalem is burning down from Nebuchadnezzar's fires, Daniel is one of the prisoners that's get taken, getting taken to Babylon in chains. And when he gets there, the king tells his servants, go out and look for some of the sharpest Hebrew boys, men, and, I and the best ones, I want you to train them, and, and they'll come in to the palace for three years, and they'll eat our food, and they'll drink our wine. Remember this? And what did Daniel say? No. I'll come in and get trained, but I'm not going to eat your food. That should tell us something, don't you think? That he's very discerning. Because if God told you to do something one way and the culture's trying to do another way, you say, no, I'm going to follow God. And he did it. He said he purposed in his heart. I love that phrase, don't you? When you purpose in your heart, you're making a decision. I'm putting my foot down. He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies. And that's what we have to think about in our culture today. Because a lot of things that were considered deviant when I was younger are not considered deviant anymore. They're, they're normalizing those things that we know the Bible calls sinful. They want to make it look like we're the bad people for calling it out. But what I'm just saying, like, God gave us a rule book for life. And we don't defile the sacred things that he gives us. Amen. So we have to stay, just like Daniel, I'm going to stay grounded. I'm not going to eat the food that the king offers me. I'm not going to feed on the cultural ways of life. I'm going to feed on the word of God as how I'm going to live my life. And it, I love this too. In 20, it said, In all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found the Jewish boys, right? We know it's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. See, you can stick with God and prosper. And you don't have to eat the food that the world is offering you. And then I thought of Nehemiah too, because I quoted it earlier today. You know, like this guy, he had a vision. He had a burden on his heart. He was sitting in the palace. He had a great job working for the king. And, you know, he, he was the food taster, so it's a little bit of a risky job. Probably wouldn't have gotten life insurance in that role. Or there would have been, they call it a rider on the policy. We'll pay, we'll pay you if you die, your family if you die, but not if you get poisoned. Because <laughs> every day if somebody was trying to take out the king, he had to taste the food first, right? So it's a risky job, but he's living in the palace. And all of a sudden, he sees somebody coming back from Jerusalem and says, how is it going? And it wasn't a good report. And, and Nehemiah gets hit with a burden, and he fasts and prays and weeps for Jerusalem. That's called having a burden. That's a good thing. Trisha and I have a burden for this region. We really do. I'm not trying to compare myself to Nehemiah, but it's really hard to plant a church and, and start something from scratch if you don't have a burden. Because there's going to be times when you'll get discouraged and people say things and, and things happen. And you're like, yeah, but we know God told us to do this. And we have a burden for this region, so we're going to keep on pressing in. I'm not trying to make us into some kind of heroes for that. I'm just saying, like, for any great thing to be done, a, a vision and a burden is a huge part of it. Amen? Yeah. Do you have a vision and a burden? Yeah. That's okay. If, it's not, if the answer is no, ask the Lord for it. He'll tell you. He's short of workers, right? Jesus said, look, white unto harvest, where's the laborers? Here they are, right in the church, watching online. He can use any one of us. Isn't that amazing? We don't have to submit a resume first and we'll get back to you. You're available, I'll use you. I'll find a place to use you. Oh, that excites me. So these two enemies of Nehemiah, Samballot and Geshem, they came and said, come, let us meet together among the villages in the plains of Ono. But Nehemiah, again, just like Daniel, very discerning, understood the spiritual warfare that was going on. Not, sorry, they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? And I want to say that to the Church of America right now. We can't let the work cease. This is the time we need to pray more than any other time. I'm telling you, I'm coming up on the 40th anniversary of the event that happened in my life. In two weeks, it'll be 40 years since my uncle was murdered in 1980. It was December 22nd, 1980. And, and in the 40 years, 
Like, I didn't get saved when he was killed. It took two more years after that before I bowed my knee. But it was that event that happened that pulled a rug out from under my life that caused me to really just crash uh, terribly emotionally. And just, it was, a lot of you know, it was my mother who was the Christian in my life that was modeling something very different. And it took two years, but I, I bowed my knee to the Lord. And, and the world was a very different place 40 years ago, I can tell you. And in many ways, the society still have much more godly influence than it does today. But God, okay, we can't wring our hands unless the church is fully operating the way we're supposed to be. The judgment has to begin here. So if the culture is diminishing in ethical standards, the church has something to say about that. We can do something about it. And if we don't do something about it, then we can't blame the heathen, right? So we will do something about it. I'm doing a great work. I'm not coming down. I'm involved with the kingdom of God. And then there's this gate idea, which I already kind of alluded to, is that it seems a little bit unfair that God says, if you want to follow me, it's going to be a narrow gate. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's going to be a narrow gate. The wide gate is the easier one to follow. That doesn't take nearly as much discipline. So in verse 12 of Matthew 7, we know it as the golden rule. He says, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets, okay? So if a guy is trying to get a girl drunk on a date, the Holy Spirit will come in and say, what if that was your daughter? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that gives me a whole different way of looking at it, doesn't it? Like, no, no, maybe I won't do what I was thinking I was going to do. I'm going to repress that appetite. See, because gravity, I've told you, is trying to pull us down all, all the time. It's trying to pull us down. But you live through the, through the Lord's lens, and he gives you this law of lift. And you can overcome gravity just like that plane does. You can come above it by doing it the Lord's way and not the culture's way. The essence of all that is taught in the Law and Prophets, it says in the New Living Translation, is to treat other people the way you'd want to be treated if you were them. My interpretation. Then right after that, he says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. See, that's why I keep talking about the self-control piece of Holy Spirit. It's that not that God is making it hard for us. It's that when Adam and Eve sinned in that garden, they opened a door to sin and warfare in the, in the earth. So while we're still here in this dispensation, we have the advantage of having Holy Spirit and the Word of God and living in a country where we're allowed to worship. Amen? And in Jesus' name, we're going to continue to be allowed to worship. Right? Because right on the dollar bill, it says, in God we trust. And that's a beautiful thing about America. And we've sent more missionaries from here than any other country in the history of the world. And if you like Dutch Sheets, he'll give you a lot of the history about how, what that meant. And, and, that, and the first people that planted a flag said, from these shores is going to go the gospel to all the nations. A man named Hunt down in, in Florida where he landed near Tallahassee. The first Christian thing that was said was we're going to send the gospel from these shores. We're going to have the freedom to be a mission-sending country. And we have been. And we still are. And we're not going to stop in Jesus' name. Amen. Because you guys are the remnant. <laughs> the narrow gate, though, it says in verse 13, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. <laughs> I can tell you that from personal experience. 40 years ago, I was on the highway to hell before I got saved. And there's lots of choices when it comes to if you want to live a sinful life. Lots of choices. And usually it's the people that are hurting the most that are the most available to sin with you. Which the church should break the church's heart, right? Because I, after I got saved, I looked back on the lifestyle I led and I realized that many of the people I had been involved in sin with came from broken situations. And we were just looking like misery loves company, you know that one? Like the, the, that, that orphan spirit just like attracted to each other. And, and we all just kind of kept confirming the lies that the other person wanted to believe. But then the truth comes and confronts you and said, there's a better way. Not an easier way, because you're going to have to 
lay down some of that old stuff that you were trusting in, but once you see the light, it's like, I'm going back. I've tasted the real thing, and I can't go back to the counterfeits that the, that the devil was trying to offer me back then. So I don't mind this, because I know the highway to hell is broad, and that gate is wide, and many are the, are the people that choose that. But God, see, that's where we step in and we be the light in the, in the darkness and say, there's a better way. Yeah, you don't have to preach a big, long sermon. You just have to model it to them that there's a better way. The gateway to life is narrow and that road is difficult because it requires us to submit the nature that we inherited from Adam and Eve, which is rebellious. And we have to submit that nature to God and say, not by my will, Lord, I'm going to operate by your will. Give me today the daily bread that I need. Don't let me fall into that temptation. Give me the strength to avoid all the little landmines the enemy will put up around me. Because I want to do it your way. I've learned, Lord, that your way is the best way. But that my flesh keeps trying to deviate and get me down off the wall of this plan that you have for me. So I'm going to wrap it up um, just with this road to Emmaus, because it's just such a beautiful picture for us. If we think about the title today, it's refusing to dine with the father of lies, right? And Jesus says these really hard to understand things when he's with us. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part with me, right? Anybody else beside me confused by that one? Raise your hand, okay, if that's true. One guy said he was confused. Two guys, thank you. I'm not the only one. Three, thank you. Going once. <laughs> so it's like, what do you mean? Like they thought he was talking about cannibalism. No. It's that the, the, this is the meal of the Lord. If you eat the word, if you stay with me, if you, if you pray and ask the Holy Spirit to show you how to live your life, you'll be dining on the food I give you. I'm the bread of life. I'm going to make you the light of the world, the salt of the earth, if you're connected to me. We can be partially connected in some areas of our life, but he's saying, no, everything. I want you to love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, not just parts of it. And I'll work with you. If you'll submit to me, I'll work with you and help you. Those areas that are not yet under the control of the Spirit, I'll bring them under the control if you'll submit your will to me. So I'll stretch you maybe a little bit because it says the two disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus, which was seven miles away from Jerusalem. It's on the first day of the week, the day that Jesus resurrects, and he comes up to them, but they don't recognize him. You remember this? There was something about the resurrected Jesus that allowed him to keep himself hidden from other people. Because it happened in other occasions too, right? It happened to the apostles when they were in the boat. They dared not ask. It says they knew it was him, but they dared not ask. There was this difference about him in the resurrected body. I believe that's going to be what we're going to look like in the resurrection. You know that your body's going to be resurrected someday, right? And that we're going to live and rule and reign with him. And I believe that's what Adam and Eve had before they sinned. But once sin came into the world, that brought death. Jesus defeated death when he rose from the, from the dead. We have this deposit of the Holy Spirit to show us what it's like to have Holy Spirit. But when he returns for good and we rule and reign with him, this is what our bodies are going to be like. I think that's pretty cool. How many would like a 2.0 version of you? Yes, sir. Me too. Every year that passes, I want it more. <laughs> so they're... They're walking down the road, and Jesus starts speaking to them, and, and they're a little confused. I believe it was a husband and wife. You can take that for, what, for whatever you want. It says two disciples, and it gives the name of one of them as Cleopas. It doesn't tell us who the other one is. But either way, they invite Jesus to come and share a meal in the house where they're staying. So a husband and wife would make a lot of sense if you believe what I'm about to tell you, because it was the husband and wife that messed up in the first place, isn't it? It was Adam and Eve that messed up. So wouldn't it make sense that it would be Cleopas as the man and his wife that are inviting Jesus in? Because there's something about what he's saying. They refer to it later. They say, wasn't our hearts burning as he was opening up the scriptures to us? You get that, right? Like, don't, don't you feel that sometimes when, when the truth of the word just hits you and you're like, wait a minute, I'm going to replay what Bill Johnson just said. Or, you know, whoever you're listening to, like, I never thought of it that way before. It has life to it. All of a sudden, it's providing nourishment to us. Why? Because we're hungry. And we could be listening to sports or whatever else. I don't know what women like to listen to, but sports is always a, a big distraction for men. And it's like, no, I'm choosing to feed on God. 
And I have an unlimited resource right here in my pocket for scripture and teaching. And God, there's just so much. If I want it, it's there and I can go get it. And it says this in Luke 29, I'm sorry, chapter 24, verse 29. They invite him and they say, abide with us for it's toward evening and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. And it came to pass as he sat at the table with them. What did he do? He took bread. He blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to them. What does that remind you of? It's what he did in the upper room with the, with the disciples. And he said, whenever you take this Passover meal, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. This is my body. This is my blood. Do this. It's the blood of the new covenant that I want for you. And now they're sitting in the table, and now all of a sudden, as, as he breaks the bread, their eyes are opened. But isn't it ironic that when Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing about the knowledge of the good tree of good and evil was their eyes were opened to the wrong thing. And now all of a sudden, Jesus is with us in the resurrected version. And in the breaking of the bread, he reveals himself to us. Selah. Pause and pray and meditate. What does that mean? Start on your knees every morning. Break bread. Start and say, Lord, I acknowledge this day. I need you. Give me the fresh manna today, not yesterday's manna. I know in my flesh I'm, I'm apt to fall. I'm apt to stumble. I'm apt to be too prideful and take on my own responsibility when I know I'm supposed to give it over to you. And if I really do love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, which is the greatest commandment, and then you expect me to love other people the way I love you, then I have to start on my knees and acknowledge I need you to do this because of my own strength, I won't get that done. And their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. But that's available to every one of us right now. Isn't this a good dispensation to be living in? Aren't you glad we're on this side of the book of Acts? And, you know, people have asked me about my email address. I put the number 291 at the end of my name in my email, and it's for Acts chapter 29, verse 1, which there is no book of Acts chapter 29. It ends with 28, right? But what about if there was? Like this, what we're doing is supposed to be Acts 29. And it's a real version in real time. And you don't really get to practice much. So you start on your knees and you say, I know a lot of stuff's going to unfold today for me, Lord. But if you're with me, oh, I can do all things through you who strengthen me. All right, almost done. Verse 32. Thank you, Nate president of my fan club over there. Well, I'll say vice president because Trish is the president of my fan club. Ah, it's a very diversified board here. I have a woman and an African-American man. See, I'm a diversified guy with my board. 32 says, and they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? That was one of the messages Bill Johnson spoke that really... Uh, spoke to me, he said, we should be called the church of the burning heart. Not a Catholic thing, you know, the sacred heart, remember? Those of you that grew up that way, he's holding his heart out in the open. and That's not the worst thing, is it? Like, imagine if all of us could live with that much honesty that we just held our hearts out to people and let them see it. But no, this is burning hearts. And if the church is full of people burning for the Lord, that's a church that's going to attract people with the light of God, right? And I think I might have said this story, but it just bears repeating because, you know, I love Bill Johnson. He's a, a fifth-generation pastor. He's just gotten a father's blessing. You could just see it. It's all over his life. And it's beautiful how his church has impacted the whole world. It's amazing how one local church in, you know, kind of the backwoods of Northern California is known all over the world because he was willing to just submit to what the Lord was trying to do to, for him. And he was at a conference with Heidi Baker, and he was waiting as the worship was going on, and the praise and worship was going on, and there was a lady next to him. And I don't know if you know this, but he himself is a musician. He led worship, plays the piano. His father uh, had a big impact on him that way. So, you know, he's, he's not a novice when it comes to music. And as he's waiting to go up to speak during praise and worship. There's this girl over here who's singing way off key. 
and really loud. <laughs> and he was getting annoyed. You know, he's just being honest as he's talking and he was getting annoyed. And he's saying, oh my God, can't somebody tell her to please just turn the volume down a little? It's so distracting. And then Heidi Baker comes and walks up next to, next to him and puts her arm around him and says, look at her. Isn't she amazing? <laughs> 35 years, a prostitute got saved. And when she comes in, she can't help it. She just has to worship. He went, oh, I'm so sorry, God, that I allowed my flesh to get in the way and be annoyed by that. This is what we live for. Doesn't matter how bad the situation is. God can turn somebody's life around. Who am I to judge? Right? Like, go for it, lady. This is way better than 35 years of selling your body and defiling yourself. Like, we don't have the right to do that, do we? I mean, we do. We get annoyed. I get it. We get annoyed by things in church sometimes. But like, you just... If you've been on the other side, you know how great it feels for people to just accept you and love you for who you are and not put you through this lens of, you know, you don't meet my standards. All right, so I'm just going to quote something to you, and then I'm going to end. How am I doing here? Almost done. So, you know, throughout history, there's, there's been many historians that wondered why Christianity was able to succeed beyond any other religion and and when it had such very humble roots right I mean you've heard it probably uh, in New York City when they Carnegie Hall at the play and they have that one solitary life poem at the end of it he never went very far from where he lived he was only 33 years old but it was the early church and there was a there was a guy that's not a believer well actually this guy was but then there's other other people that still aren't believers but say there's there's no other way Christianity could have gotten so popular if Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. It's amazing, isn't it? Even an unbeliever can make that statement. So this is what one guy said about, the Christian said about the rise of Christianity. One of the most striking things about the early Christians was exemplified in ancient Turkey during a plague. All right, so we're in the middle of a plague right now. The rich and the well-to-do, and particularly the doctors, would gather up their family and possessions and leave town, and they would flee to the hills to the fresher, less polluted air, or to friends and family in towns far away. But the Christians, often among the poorest, and many of them slaves, would stay and nurse the people, including those who were neither Christians or family members or in any other way related to them. Sometimes. The people that were sick got well again. Not all the diseases were necessarily fatal. And sometimes the Christians would themselves catch the disease and die from it. Here's what I want you to remember. But the point was made graphically and unmistakably. This was a different way to be human. <laughs> Woo! That should be convicting, huh? How about me? Am I living in a way that someone would look at me and say, I don't know what it is about him, but he's different. And not in a crazy way. Like, he's operating off of a different GPS. Like, he's tuned into a different satellite. And the decisions he makes are different than the people on the job make. Or, and it's not better than anybody. It's just tuned into the source, right? These people were living it in a way that the unbelievers were looking and saying, that's a different way to be human. You're not sleeping around. You're, you're committed to one spouse for, for your whole life. You're disciplining your children in a different way than we are. What's different about you? And then he gives the answer. The Christians, when they were called upon to explain the habits of heart which made it second nature, right? That's a powerful thing right there. He comes in and gives us that second nature of heaven to override the pull of our, of our earthly nature. What was it that made it second nature to do these things? They would talk about Jesus and about the God that they had discovered through Jesus, whose very own nature was self-giving love. That's what Heidi Baker was saying to Bill Johnson that day, right? Look at her, 35 years of prostitute, saved, sanctified, set apart, 
innocence restored. What the world would say is impossible. Nothing's impossible with God. Amen? All right, let's stand up and we'll make a declaration to end. I love this uh, version of that verse I quoted to you. It's Romans chapter 5, verse 20. And if you go on Bible Hub, you can compare all different versions of the same verse. It's a great tool. Bible Gateway and Bible Hub, man, they'll keep you busy with the Word. And they're both free. It's awesome. But it says in this particular version, where sin abounded, the grace of God did superabound. That's a good word, right? You might not like what's going on in the culture. I sure don't. And I'm out with unsaved people all the time. So I get the line that we're trying to be sold right now, and I don't buy it. So I understand it's complicated and whatever. That's another day's topic. But I got to look in the mirror first. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. What am I doing to change it? How am I living my life in a way that says that's a different way to be human? Pretty big obligation, isn't it? But Jesus looked at Peter, and you know, remember Peter had a kind of a checkered background, you know, some sketchy decisions that he had made. And when Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And then they gave the different answers. And then Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? What did he say? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. <laughs> Lord, where can we go? You're the bread of life. Where can we go? We're not leaving. You're the one. We know that you're the one. Other people might have left, but we know you're the one. And that's when Jesus looked at him and said, on that rock, I believe, of your confession, Peter, that Jesus Christ is Lord, on that rock, I will build my church. Who's, who's speaking now? Jesus said, I will build, say it again, my church. I will build my church. It's not Peter and Trisha's church. It's not the nomination's church. It's the church of Jesus Christ, right? On that rock, I will build my church. Jesus is still building his church on that rock. You believe that? You know, in America, it looks like many churches are watering down the word. Sorry, I'm not trying to be the police here. But you, don't, you just can't, you can't skim on the truth. His church is going to be telling the truth. Even when people don't want to hear it. Like, we're not going to tickle people's ears because we're worried about offending them. We're gonna give them the truth. We'll do it with love, but we gotta tell them the truth, right? That gates of hell will not prevail against my church. That's what Jesus said. I think we should say it out loud. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. So here's what I want you to think about. If the gates of hell are prevailing, maybe it's not his church. So, who has to change? Raise your hand. <laughs> We're the church. So if you don't like what's happening in culture, start with yourself and say, I'm going to be living a different model now. And instead of fighting flesh with flesh, I'm going to fast and pray and ask the Lord for the right strategy so that we can be those different people. Amen. And Jesus said, I will give you, not just Peter, but all of us, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That means that we can bring heaven to earth. Lord, as in heaven, so on earth. As it is in heaven, let it be here on earth this day. Come, Lord. I have the keys. And that will give you authority to bind and loose. Amen. So let's lift our hands. Lord, I want to submit to your authority over my life. Thank you for giving me the keys. Thank you for making that road available. It might be narrow, but it's available. <laughs> and I choose, Lord, I make a decision in my life to be the difference maker that you want here in this earth, not to just collapse under the pressure of the culture and say the easy thing or look the other way, but to speak the truth in love. I refuse to dine with the father of lies. I will eat your word. I will speak the truth of God, but I'll do it with your oil, with the love of your Holy Spirit operating in me so that we can all be obedient to your call, that our food would be to do the will of the one who sent us. Heavenly Father, Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. I bless your people to go and be those change agents today in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. Lift a shout, man, it's good. It's good to celebrate with the Lord. I pray you have an awesome week. If you can come out Friday, that'd be great. 
not a big deal. We're gonna be watching uh, part of that uh, live stream and uh, singing some Christmas carols. So if you can make it, that'd be great. Love to have you, just have to register in advance. Have an awesome day. If you need prayer, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna still honor the social distancing, but you can come up to the front here and we'll, we'll hear the need and we'll pray with you. So you don't have to run out.